very pleasant good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for coming out this afternoon. I'm certainly pleased to give a few remarks here today. And I'd like to acknowledge and welcome the panelists who are here. They'll all be speaking and taking questions as we work through the afternoon. Last week, Cayman Airways announced that the Civil Aviation Authority of the Cayman Islands had rescinded its airspace restriction for the Boeing 7378 aircraft. This means that Cayman Airways, two such aircraft that have been grounded since 2019 are now cleared to return to service. The Cayman Island government is the major shareholder in Cayman Airways, and as such, I feel confident in saying that the safety of the public and the airline's employees is the number one priority of Cayman Airways. Moreover, it remains at the forefront of their actions and decision making. This was evidenced by the fact that Cayman Airways was the first international airline to voluntarily ground its Boeing 7378 fleet following the unfortunate accident that occurred in 2019, leading that would become a worldwide response. Since then, both Cayman Airways 7378 aircraft have undergone extensive test flights in conjunction with the Cayman with the CAACI and Boeing have received the modifications and updates recommended by Boeing. Additionally, the aircraft have been put through extensive analysis and have completed their scheduled maintenance as specified by the manufacturer and regulator. I'm very pleased this afternoon to be joined by our aviation regulators, Civil Aviation Authority, who will be able to speak to the basis of the decision to unground the aircraft. I'm also happy that we have some of our very experienced and qualified Cayman Airways pilots here who will be able to speak more about the many tests and certifications they have gone through in order to test the aircraft safety. I'd like to express my thanks to the Cayman Airways Board of Directors, Chairman Cook, who's here with us, the management team, and every member of staff for their tireless efforts, hard work, and dedication to building our national airlines into one of the best and safest in the world. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Minister. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Philip Rankin. I'm the chairman of uh, the board of directors of Cayman Airways. I first became board member in 2009 and chaired the Financial Matters uh, Subcommittee of the board and then became chairman uh, in 2012 until present. In 2015, as part of uh, Cayman Airways strategic plan, it was decided that the agent Boeing 737-300 fleet that we had would need to be replaced with newer and more fuel efficient aircraft over the subsequent five years. With this aim in mind, Cayman Airways explored all the possible options for replacement of the 300 aircraft fleet and arrived at either the Boeing 737-800 NG series or the brand new Boeing 737-8 series <coughs> with, with a specifically a specially negotiated lease arrangement with Air Lease Corporation and the Boeing Corporation Cayman Airways was able to obtain the new Dash 8 aircraft lease rates, which were comparable to that of an aircraft that was at least 10 to 15 years old. In other words, we were able to lease a new plane uh, for less than what we could get a 15-year-old plane for. So needless to say, the decision really was not hard. This meant that Cayman Airways would, would be able to access the reliability and efficiency that came with the new aircraft without having to bear the costs associated with new aircraft. As you may be aware, the 737-8 aircraft uses approximately 15% less fuel than the than 300 and at the same time carries 40 more passengers. It also has a much lar larger cargo um, carrying capacity which were part and parcel of the business plan that we did. 
in addition to in addition to the cargo, it has an incredibly long range, and it was essentially the perfect aircraft to take Cayman Airways into the future. The 15% reduction in fuel uh, savings equates to about 25% in terms of fuel costs. And one of the reasons why we can do that is because we, we're able to tank our fuel from other airports that has a much cheaper upload than, than purchasing it in Grand Cayman. Um, so needless to say, when, when we had to, um, we had just taken delivery of the second aircraft uh, I think two days, she was on the island perhaps two days before we had to um, ground the aircraft, which I believe we were the, one of the first airlines to do that. I'm going to leave the discussion pertaining to the grounding to our CEO, and he can uh, explain further on that. Baby. Okay, thank you, Chairman Andrew. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Just to um, briefly pick up on where Chairman Rankin left off with respect to the, the grounding, um, the tragic loss of Ethiopian Airlines Flight Six, Flight 302 on the 10th of March is, is well known and um, there was tremendous loss of life. Of course, there was uh, a previous tragic loss some four and a half months for, before with Lion Air Flight 601, I believe the flight number was. Uh, again, very tragic loss of life. What typically happens in the airline industry whenever there's a tragic accident is that the first thing that airlines uh, and regulators seek to find out is what exactly happened. And that usually will take quite some time. It usually involves um, the retrieval of flight data recorders, reconstruction of the the accident before the cause is known and after the cause is known then the the necessary actions uh, would be taken to address what caused the accident so it was actually a bit unusual for an airline to to decide to ground its fleet because with this comes um, you know, tremendous inconvenience to passengers because there would be uh, an immediate cancellation of flights. For us on the day, um, the similarities between the two accidents that preceded the, on the grounding were just too glaringly similar. And it didn't take us very long to come to the decision that while other airlines may battle with the, the notion of not taking any action until they knew what had transpired. Our position was that we are going to take action because we don't know what had transpired. And to me, the, there was unanimous support when I first reached out uh, initially to the shareholder, to our regulator. Um, there was tremendous consensus on, on that. And what it demonstrates to me is that um, safety really does come first at Cayman Airways. It took a total of about five days before all the 737-8s um, were eventually grounded. So that in itself is an indication of where those airlines place their priorities. Uh, I'm not here to be critical of other airlines, but um, to me the point really was driven home that safety was our first priority. And it's been 23 months since the aircraft have been um, grounded. During that 23-month period, the exact cause of the, the accidents were determined. And the resolutions were put in place. Um, I think Mr. Smith may speak to some of these. Um, if he doesn't, um, Captain Scott will certainly go into um, some of what the, the technical resolutions were. But over the 23 months, the, the entire world became extremely cautious and understandably apprehensive about, you know, the 737-8s returning to service. 
This meant that the aircraft received a level of scrutiny from regulatory authorities throughout the world, which was unprecedented in the airline industry. It also meant that um, we as an airline, I, I can only speak for Cayman Airways, we kept ourselves thoroughly abreast <coughs> with all of the developments, all of the proposed design changes. We participated in events where we, we were allowed to, to have input with the manufacturer as to what some of these changes should be. And we have been quite comfortable for some time that with the changes that have been implemented, it is now impossible for an accident such as what happened with Ethiopian or Lion Air to repeat itself. It is literally impossible for that to happen again. And with that, um, we have a certain amount of confidence in placing the aircraft back into service. And I want it to be remembered that if there was ever an airline that was cautious in the first instance, we demonstrated that care, diligence, and cautiousness when we voluntarily withdrew the aircraft from service. And we would not for a minute attempt to put it back into service with any less care, caution, or diligence than we had on March 10th, 2019, when we grounded the aircraft. Um, we have a series of events uh, lined up which uh, to some degree are over and above the regulatory requirements. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, even though the, the aircraft may have been ungrounded by the Civil Aviation Authority um, on the 27th of January, Mr. Smith, uh, we're not going to, we have not yet operated any flights with the airplane. And um, we plan to operate our first passenger flight only after we take some additional over and above actions. Um, some of this has to do with pilot training, where we're taking steps over and above what's happening in the industry, and Captain Scott will speak to some of that. Um, some of it has to do with maintenance personnel training, which has already taken place. A lot has been said about pilot training with respect to the MCAS story and the 737-8, but you've not really heard very much or read very much in the media about maintenance. And um, the maintenance element cannot be overlooked. Um, the, the Lion Air incident was preceded by a maintenance event, which if it was addressed correctly, it may have in fact prevented that accident. Uh, I don't say that with any definite um, I'm not in a position to be definitive on that, but I'm in a position to share my opinion. And my background is in engineering. So we're taking all of the necessary steps that we think are necessary to put the aircraft back into service safely. Tomorrow, we will be removing one of the aircraft that have been in a very special storage program over the last 23 months. We refer to it as active storage because we have kept the airplanes active. Most airlines that have parked their grounded aircraft, those aircraft were deactivated, put into deep storage, pres preserved, and it's a big process to take them back out. We kept our aircraft maintained for the entire 23 months as if they were flying. And at any given point, they were ready to fly. As a matter of fact, we did some flights with these aircraft, uh, the media may remember, when we sent them to Victorville in, in California to have some of the work done. Um, some of that work that was done was in fact the, the rectification work to the MCAS. But we also did some additional work, which, which was some over and, above, um, over and above items. So tomorrow, um, somewhere around 9 a.m., we will have our first flight. It's what we call an operational readiness flight. It's where we are going to put the aircraft through its paces. It's going to be a thorough test flight. 
The aircraft is very advanced and it reports all of its parameters to the ground. So we have a Boeing representative here on site in Cayman who will be monitoring the aircraft's performance for the entire flight. We plan to actually fly to Jamaica and shoot an approach into Montego Bay because they have an instrument landing system which we don't have, so it will allow us to test that system. And then go to Kingston and do a precision GPS approach, which is another form of instrument approach. And um, we will be notifying the, the Jamaican media and so on that we plan to do this because it may appear to an observer that we have attempted to land and did not land. So we, we want to make it clear that there's nothing untoward happening. It's, it's just uh, us putting the aircraft through its paces. So that happens with the first aircraft uh, tomorrow, Thursday the 11th. And on Friday the 12th, the second airplane will be put through its paces. It will be flown by Captain Stephen Coe and Captain Perry Panton. Uh, Captain Perry Panton is our chief pilot, Captain Stephen Coe is our head of flight standards and training. And these two pilots have continuously remained con um, current on the 737-8 for the entire 23 month period. So all the movements of the aircraft that we have done, they, they were the two pilots that were in command. The, the remaining pilots um, have not flown the airplane. And one of the over and aboves that we're doing again is we're going to ensure that they all have an opportunity to do not one or two, but probably three flights. We, we'll call them touch and goes. Uh, so these are training flights to make sure that they regain the feel for the aircraft and they feel no discomfort um, uh, moving from the 737-300 into the 737-8. The way this is happening in the rest of the industry is that this training is done in a simulator. And the pilots, once they finish their simulator checks, they go straight onto the airplane and fly. We're not doing that. We're going to make sure our pilots, as, as we say, as I've said, um, do a series of flights. So those training flights will be taking place on the 13th of February, which is a Saturday, the Sunday the 14th, and Monday the 15th three days of training flights. Something else that is happening on the 13th, which we have already um, publicized, is that we're having an open house. So the general public will have the opportunity to come and see the aircraft, but more importantly, we'll have um, several captains, several senior captains on hand to answer any questions or address any apprehensions that the, the traveling public may have with respect to, to flying on a 737-8. On the 18th of February, which is a Thursday, this will actually be the first passenger flight, or I should say flights, that we will be doing. Because we will be taking both 737 Maxes to Cayman Brac with members of our staff, um, specially invited guests. Um, there will be government officials on board. And all of this is, it's being done to help demonstrate that the aircraft is in fact safe to, to operate. It's also to give the residents of Cayman Brac an opportunity to tour the aircraft just as would have been the case for the residents of Grand Cayman who will be doing their tour uh, this Saturday. So those will be our first um, passenger flights. The passengers who will be on that flight, as I said, they're invited guests and employees of the airline. It is not what we call a revenue flight. Our first revenue flight will be a flight to Miami, which is at this point planned for the 19th of February. And all subsequent flights operated by Cayman Airways will then be operated by the 737-8. We have kept the 737-300s 
for approximately two years past the point at which we had planned to retire mm -hmm. them. And the fact that the 737-8s are now coming back online is very timely because those 737-300 aircraft have become tremendously expensive to maintain and uh, they're a bit of a challenge uh, when it comes to the reliability factor. They're old aircraft. They're 26 and 27 years old. So the, the, their time has come. So um, again, we're putting the aircraft back into service, but we're doing it with great care, caution, and diligence, and a lot of confidence. And as what, what Mr. Smith would know, um, he's very familiar with this regulatory term. It, it's that of the accountable manager. It means that, you know, Cayman Airways has a comprehensive safety management system, but there is one individual who can be personally or who is personally held accountable for the safety and security of the airline. And um, I happen to wear that hat. And it's the most important hat I wear in my life, period because it's not just about me, it's about the safety of everyone who flies on Cayman Airways. So I take that role extremely seriously. Um, I think over the years, Mr. Smith has come to realize that um, I fully understand my responsibilities and I would not be a part of taking any chances um, because it, it's just not, not within my makeup. So um, with that said, I think I've covered most of what I needed to cover. Um, I think it's next for Captain Dave to continue on to elaborate on, on some of what I spoke about. I think I may have spoke a little bit too much about some of your topics, but... Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Wormstead was speaking about the MCAS. The MCAS system was fixed back in October last year. So basically, what caused those two unfortunate accidents was repaired quite a while back. I've been in aviation for 44 years, and it's the first aircraft I've seen to undergo such scrutiny in its certification and this was a recertification process. I'm very confident of all the fixes that have taken place. I have no hesitation to put my family or friends invited on board the aircraft. What happened was unfortunate, and it is something that aviation pilots and um, personnel would never forget. But with the fixes, I'm confident it's not going to happen again. Mr. Worms keeps speaking about over and above. Well, during this process of recertifying the aircraft, we've done a lot of webinars, attended a lot of uh, meetings. There was one particular one which sticks out in my mind. We were at a symposium, and they were speaking about training on the MAX, and they asked how many pilots have actually flown the 737-8 simulator. And there were about 30 different airlines in the room, and two airlines raised their hands. And one of them was Cayman Airways. The instructor, or the lecture was a little bit taken back because what normally took place was that you do a 10 minute or 45 minute iPad lesson, you jump in the aircraft and you go. We went over and above that. We did a full 737-8 course and then we did a whole recurrent in the simulator. I have flown the simulator before the MCAS problem was fixed and I've flown it since, and I can see where it'll never happen again. That I'm confident of. 
Since the grounding, we have kept our pilots current on the 737-8. They go to simulator every six months. As a matter of fact, I have a group going off. I think it's the 3rd of March. They start to go off to simulator in Miami to do recurrent on the 737-8. Although I do not fly anymore, I still do instructing on the aircraft, and I will be up there somewhere around the middle of March to observe and to ensure, because when Mr. Smith is asking questions, I have to have answers. He's a regulator. So I can look him in the eye and say, yes, I saw it happen. They did good or they did bad, whatever. We take no chances. Everything, again, we come back to that over and above. We train our pilots thoroughly. We are planning to go up to Cayman Brack with both aircrafts, as Mr. Worm said. And, you know, a lot of people saying that the aircraft are too big to go into the brat. There's an airline out in Brazil that operates into a 5,000 foot runway with all different types of aircraft. So this is no problem for the 737-8. Don't let anybody say anything else about that. We've done quite a bit of work as required by our regulator and the manufacturer in regards to training. Manuals have to be updated. Procedures were changed. A lot of work. And we were always right on the ball because when Mr. Smith and his team would come and say, I have this been done, we had all the paperwork to show him, yes, sir, here you go, inspect it. And that is how we stay ahead of the game at all times. Safety, our number one priority. Mr. Smith. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Richard Smith. I'm the Director General of Civil Aviation for the Civil Aviation Authority of the Cayman Islands. Um, the safety and security of aviation is a direct responsibility of the governor it is uh, one of those disciplines that is maintained by the UK. And as such, the governor, in turn, designates his powers to a competent authority to carry out his responsibilities. And uh, in this case, the powers that we exercise are directly powers of the governor in this regard for the safety of aviation regulation. The legislative uh, statutory instruments that are used in this regard are also produced directly by the UK Department for Transport. And uh, the requirements or the regulations to, to complement those statutory um, legislation is done through Air Safety Support International, which is a subsidiary of the UK CAA. The Cayman Island Civil Aviation Authority is one of three of the Overseas Territories Authority that holds full designation for the, regu the safety regulation of all things aviation. Uh, it's, a, it's a responsibility that is taken very seriously, and uh, that's why um, we're here today to speak in support of the operator. Air transport in itself is the safest mode of transport, of transportation. And I say that not because we're directly involved, but um, it can certainly be verified. Unfortunately, whenever there's a incident or an accident, it normally involves large numbers of persons and thereby it draws a lot of attention. Um, but if you look at the stats and compare your transport 
um, compared to even road transport, you will see that air transport is by far a much safer mode of transportation. We can't forget why we're here. We're here today because of the events of uh, the accidents that happened with the aircraft in question today. We must never forget um, there were 346 persons that perished as a result of that. And we must always keep that in the forefront because that it w is what will keep us focused on our responsibility for safety regulations. Uh, following those accidents, as you've heard from Mr. Worms, uh, Cayman Airways took um, what would be, be seen as an unprecedented decision to immediately uh, ground those aircraft. And as he has correctly said, um, in normal um, occurrences, there would be a delay in waiting to see what might have caused that. But because they were so similar, um, uh, it raised some flags that the airline immediately took that unilateral action. And as they've correctly said, the first airline in the world to have taken such action. The Civil Aviation Authority collaborated with our counterparts in the UK and other jurisdictions as to appropriate action to be taken. And on the 12th of March, 2019, um, a grounding order was put in place for this aircraft. It has been 23 months, 22 months now since um, this, this happened. And we are at a point now where the aircraft has been declared as ready to be returned to service. Obviously, um, we have to allay the public's concerns as to why such decisions are taken now. Um, in the normal scheme of things, the state of manufacture of the aircraft, in this case, the United States FAA, would be responsible for addressing the concerns that might have been identified as a cause of these accidents. This event concerning the 737-8 was unprecedented at over a 20-month period where it was just, just not the FAA that became involved in the scrutiny. In fact, there was a joint task force of aviation authorities that included the European Aviation Safety Agency that represented all the European states, including the UK. There was the Civil Aviation Authority of Australia, of Brazil, of Canada, of China, Indonesia, Japan, Singapore, and the United Arab Emirates. So they came together and joined with the FAA to conduct the scrutiny as to how this aircraft could be put back in service, how these issues could be corrected. This has been the most extensive project of its kind undertaken in civil aviation and it shows how important the cooperation between states and regulators are in maintaining safety. The FAA declared on the 18th of uh, November uh, lifting the, the ban on the aircraft and that was followed a month after by the European Euro um, Safety Agency uh, with the issuance of an airworthiness directive uh, for operators to abide by to put the aircraft back in service. So again, in collaboration with our counterparts in, uh, in the UK and other jurisdictions, on the 27th of January, uh, we declared a lifting of the ban for the aircraft to be operated under the Cayman Islands Aircraft Registry, and also for aircraft operating in Cayman territorial um, airspace. 
Uh, it, it's been uh, an unprecedented journey, and I can say with confidence, um, having been in aviation for many years, almost as long as Captain Scott, uh, that I am very confident that the actions being taken and the decisions to put this aircraft back to service is the right one at this time, and we're confident that the public can feel assured of the safety of its operation. We're very proud of Cayman Airways as an operator under our jurisdiction, and we support them fully in their actions in, in abiding by all the safety regulations. And also joining us today, I'd like to welcome Captain Gary Hydes. He is the president of the Cayman Airline Pilots Association, and I'd like to welcome him to the podium to offer his message. Thank you, Olivia. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Executive Committee of CAPA and the entire membership, I am pleased to make the following statement. With the impending reentry of service of Cayman Airways Boeing 737-8 aircraft fleet, members of Cayman Airlines Pilots Association, CAPA, as a professional pilot body hereby offer our support for the ungrounding of the recertified aircraft. As a 100% professional body, our members are a part of the fabric of the Cayman Islands, and as such, we represent our country as well as our national airline. CAPA was founded on the principle of promoting and maintaining safe air travel to from and within our islands through the collaborative efforts and engagement of our national airline, Cayman Airways, all while continuing to earn a reputation as professional aviators who put safety first as our number one priority. While the Boeing 737-8 aircraft community in Cayman Airways livery may physically look the same, you can rest assured that after a lengthy recertification period, this aircraft is certainly not the same aircraft that was grounded in March 2019. The recertification process has designed out the triggers which were previously identified and resulted in the universal ground of the aircraft. The consensus is that because of the extraordinary scrutiny from the numerous civil aviation authorities around the world, which involve hundreds of professional engineers and pilots, we can say without hesitation that this aircraft is one of the safest aircraft to fly on right now. It is our professional opinion that a well-trained and competent crew will only add to the layers of safety now mandated by the recertification process. With that said, Cayman Airways' commitment to pilot training exceeds every civil aviation authority regulatory requirement. During the 22 months this aircraft was grounded, our members continue to be simulator trained on this aircraft. It is also noteworthy to mention that our members receive training every six months whereas many airlines around the world train their pilots less frequently to save on their training costs as little as once every 18 months. It is our learned opinion that the frequency and quality of training we receive enhances the ability of our members to respond appropriately to any unforeseen abnormal situation. We, the members of COPPA, would like to reiterate to the traveling public that the safety remains our highest priority when operating any aircraft, and we will never prioritize economics or schedule over safety. We look forward to having you on our, our value customers as well as our family members back on board the 737-8 in the not too distant future. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to open it up to a question and answer period with our local media. Andrew, uh, Andrew Harris from Cayman Compass. Uh, my first question is, um, we. It was stated that the 737-300s will be um, taken out of service. Can we get the timeline for the full fleet uh, when we will have the full four 737-8s in service? Um, the needs of Cayman Airways, right, in terms of how many aircraft we actually need to operate, at this point in time, we only need two airplanes and we're operating a schedule that is um, it, it looks nothing like our pre-covid pandemic schedule um, instead of doing 20 flights in a day we're doing 20 flights in a month so we can use the two 77 max aircraft comfortably um, address this schedule 
As a matter of fact, we're looking forward to using the 737 8 say, um, specific, specifically because of what Chairman Rankin mentioned earlier, being the increased belly space. With people traveling less, there is more demand for our cargo services. So the aircraft will, will serve quite well. With that being the case, there really is no reason for us to keep the 737-300s flying any longer. What I can say is both aircraft can continue to fly through about June this year. But what, we are in, what we're hoping to do is to dispose of them while they're still flyable so that whoever the next operator is, we can actually deliver the airplane to them while it is still current with all of its airworthiness requirements. So the timeline that you can expect is uh, definitely around about June, you definitely won't see them around, but don't expect to see them flying um, once the 737-8s are back in service. Um. And just a follow-up question on that, can we get an update on the other two uh, Dash 8s? I know that one is built and is currently in storage in the U.S., uh, and there's a fourth that we ordered. Right. Um, the third airplane is, at this point, um, it's about 18 months late in terms of its delivery. Um, so we have been displaced because we did not get that airplane when we were to have received it. And it forced us as an airline to uh, keep the 737-300s flying at great expense. Boeing is now in a position to deliver that airplane to us. However, it's not a good time for us. So we're presently in discussions with the leasing company about when that delivery will actually be. So what I can say to you is the aircraft is ready for delivery, but uh, we have not yet decided as to when that delivery will actually be. It may be sometime very soon, or it may be a few months off. All right, see. Uh, this is probably a moot point, but um, there are many people who obviously have um, hesitations and reservations surrounding traveling on the MAX 8, but in actuality, they won't have a choice, will they, come the 18th of, uh, or the 19th of February? Well, <clears throat> practically speaking, if we are the <clears throat> only airline that's operating to a destination that they would like to fly to, then they won't have an alternative choice okay. but um, they will have a choice <laughs> they, okay. don't, they don't have to fly if they don't want I see um, we, are, we are prepared that if, if we have any passengers who uh, upon uh, boarding or whatever if they have apprehensions uh, we're prepared to, to offer refunds etc okay. that's good to know alright thanks Al give way to other members of the movie and the, the obviously the the um, you you bought the maxes originally to cut down the subsidies and all the rest of it and to try and help the airline be more efficient and it would look on paper like that was going to happen so you would have eventually been reducing the subsidies obviously every airline has struggled this year it's been a dreadful year do you at this point I see Mr Tibbetts is here I think somewhere so I was just wondering if um, what, you're, what you see now is the long-term um, issue of subsidies for the airline going forward over the next few years, what it looks like, what that picture looks like. Um, can I take an initial step sure. of that? Okay. What I can say to you is that um, if we were to continue with the 737-300s versus introducing the 737-8s, we would be in a worse position. I'm not saying that the 737-8 is a panacea 
which will resolve all of Cayman Airways' um, financial challenges. But the point, I think, uh, as an airline that we were trying to make from the beginning is that the 737-300 had gotten to a point where they're too expensive to maintain, too unreliable to provide the type of service that we need to provide. And from all the options that we had, the 737-8 was the most economical option. Uh, Chairman Rankin mentioned earlier that it would cost us less to lease and operate this brand new plane than it would to operate a plane that was 10 to 15 years old. And I think, uh, I think that's the best we, we can say, Wendy, because there, there's just too much that's, that's not known at this point in time. You know? So you, you can't really give us an idea of what, you're, you, what kind of subsidy you're going to be asking for next year? I mean, I, obviously, we all know there's going to be one. It's just a, like, a ballpark figure. No, I, it would be premature for us to <clears throat> to be looking at that because there there's so many other factors that are involved. One of which depends on to what extent our borders are reopened and to what extent that our tourism industry has returned to normal. Okay, thank you, Mr. Um, Minister. D given the situation with tourism as it is, I know it's very very difficult for you to make any kind of predictions, um, but. Now that you're going to have these tools back again, which is the, the maxis with their different range, has your ministry been thinking about once the borders open, what kind of big steps you might be able to take to try and shake, to do something to help shake up tourism more quickly by using the planes? Well, I think that certainly, thank you very much for the question. The, um, the planes give us excellent tools to, um, to bring the tourists to the market. We try to make it easy for them to get here. We are looking um, with a science-driven approach as far as how the boundaries and borders will open. We look at what Cayman Airways is doing today for the country with the repatriation flights and the continued um, access to employment of our employees who are extremely important to us. And I think we're very proud of what we've been able to do through COVID. We're extremely proud of, of what they offer. You know, no other small island nation in this region has the ability to call on their own airline to run repatriation flights. And, and when we talked about repatriating 6,000 guest workers, so to speak, and what that did uh, for the economy and how it put us forward, all of these things lead back to Cayman Airways and the importance of it. So we obviously had a budget, a two-year budget. We have not had a review um, from the standpoint of the next part of this year. Um, we have continued to, whatever the government has asked Cayman Airways to do, they have delivered. And we don't expect anything to change with that. So going forward, I think the exciting part for us is that we'll be able to, to look at some other gateways. Obviously, Denver will be um, easier for us with the 8s than it was with the, the 737-300s. Um, it'll give us some opportunities to look at some other exciting gateways to, to build back our tourism product. It also allows us to understand um, what the other airlines that are going to service us. You know, tourism is you stimulate the market and explain to people that we have the best um, island for visitation, islands for visitation in this region, then you make it easy for them to come here. And, and we don't want them to have to take three or four stops to get here, so we use Cayman Airways as a point-to-point a, a -point, um, gateway to Cayman, and it, it works quite well. Um, it also allows us to, to do some regional flights that are extremely important to our economy, the Jamaica flights and the, the Hungarian flights. So again, I, I think we go back to the tool that we use for the country, and we always say the profit center is the country, um, and I think that, that we're really proud of how Cayman Airways has delivered through this COVID crisis. I think that's it. Thank you very much. You. Appreciate it. And once again, thank you very much to members of our panel today. That concludes our press conference for Kim and Airways today. Thank you all very much for coming and joining us. Thank you.